Dr. Kissinger is an old friend and good friend of the Chinese people. He is a pioneer and establisher of Sino-U.S. relations. He has long cared for and supported the development of Sino-U.S. relations. He successively visited China more than 100 times. He made historic contributions to the normalization of Sino-U.S. relations. The Chinese people will always remember Dr. Henry Kissinger for his sincere affection towards Sino-U.S. relations and the significant contributions he has made. Chinese President Xi Jinping has already expressed condolences on the passing of Dr. Henry Kissinger and sent his condolences to President Biden. Four days ago, former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger passed away at the age of 100. Henry Kissinger was a relatively important figure in the American political arena for over half a century. He has served 12 American presidents, 12 terms if you think about it, that's 48 years. This accounts for a quarter of the total number of presidents in the history of the United States. Additionally, Kissinger is also a key figure and witness in the history of thawing relations between China and the United States. He was quite important to both the China-US relationship and also China itself. So today, we are going to dedicate a special episode to talk about the story of Henry Kissinger. I have spent literally half of my life working on Chinese-American relations. Henry Kissinger was Jewish. He was born in Germany in 1923. After the Nazis came to power in Germany, they began to persecute Jews. So at the age of 15, in 1938, he emigrated to the United States with his parents. Shortly after that, the United States declared war on Germany. He joined the US military and once again returned to the European continent. After the war, he went to Harvard University. He started as a student and then worked as a teacher at Harvard. In the 1960s, he entered the United States government and was primarily responsible for the foreign policy of the United States. Later, he became the Secretary of State of the United States. In 1971, he did something that shocked the world. He secretly visited China on behalf of President Nixon. Think about what China was like at that time. China was a predominant country in the communist world, while the United States was, and still is, the leader of the free world. There was no diplomatic relationship between these two countries. In fact, it was a black and white relationship where one needed to die in order for the other to live. So just imagine the shock that the whole world would feel if he were able to visit China. In July of this year, he initially went to Vietnam and then flew to Pakistan. After arriving in Pakistan, he said he felt ill and needed to rest for a couple days. In fact, he was aboard the president of Pakistan's private jet at this time. He then secretly flew to Beijing and met with Zhou Enlai, where they had a total of two rounds of negotiations. Kissinger stayed at the Diao Yutai State Guesthouse. Finally, there was a consensus that President Nixon would visit China. At the same time, both sides negotiated on some important matters regarding Nixon's visit. Of course, besides this one time in July, he visited China several times afterward. In the end, he recognized that the Chinese Communist Party is the only legitimate representative of the People's Republic of China. And then, there was the One China principle, etc. We'll talk about this again in a bit. It should be said that these diplomatic communiques between China and the United States became the basis for U.S.-China relations for the following 50 to 60 years. These legal foundations were essential in establishing Sino-U.S. relations, so Mr. Kissinger played a pivotal role. Henry Kissinger pioneered a series of continuous visits to China. During his 50-year political career, he visited China more than 100 times, on average two to three times a year, and sometimes as many as five or six times. He is also the only American politician who has had dealings with all the past and present leaders of China, for example, Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai, Hua Guofeng, Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, and also Xi Jinping. He visited China in July of this year. When you think about it, July was only a few months before his passing. This guy was already 100 years old and was still visiting China. What I heard is that he was actually invited by the Chinese government because at that time, China was very eager to send a message to the United States through Kissinger. During his visit, there was also some fear, fear that he might die while in China. 
Uh, you think about it, he's a 100-year-old elderly individual. After arriving in China, he was accompanied by an ambulance wherever he went. There was a complete medical team constantly monitoring him, afraid that he might have a mishap during his visit to China. It would be disastrous if he passed away while in China. Anyway, why was Henry Kissinger visiting China in July this year? If you take a look at the relationship between China and the United States, because it was quite tense in the first half of this year, China wants to improve its relationship with the United States by the second half of the year. But they are unwilling to show any weakness in formal diplomatic occasions. During this time, they invited Henry Kissinger to China for a meeting. Then, they could use this opportunity to send a message to the U.S. government. Therefore, when Xi Jinping met with Henry Kissinger, he made two points. 52 years ago, also in July, it was here at Building 5 of Diaoyutai State Guest House. This is where Premier Zhou Enlai met with you and initiated the process of normalization between the two countries. At that time, it was a turning point in Sino-US relations. Chinese people do not forget old friends. The name of Henry Kissinger will always be associated with Sino-US relations. The Chinese people will always remember. I have great respect for you. About 52 years later, the Sino-U.S. relationship is once again facing a significant transformation in terms of order. China and the United States can fully cooperate with each other and work together for mutual development. Who is this statement directed towards? It's a message for the United States government, not Kissinger. Didn't I say a few days ago that Fumio Kushida will also visit China in a while? Actually, Fumio Kushida is mentally not all there these days, but why do they want to let him visit China? It's just because he is pro-China. After he arrives in China, the Chinese leaders will present some gifts symbolizing the past improvements in relations between China and Japan. In reality, the same is true of Kissinger. He's like an evergreen tree when it comes to politics. Although he was very long-lived and received special treatment when visiting China, he can also be seen as simply a tool from a certain perspective. So, Henry Kissinger's uh, visit to China is actually just a medium for the Chinese government to convey messages to the US government. After Henry Kissinger's death, opinions about him varied around the world. In the English-speaking world, he has mixed reviews. He was the most important formulator in the application of the pragmatic foreign policy approach of the United States in the last century. So in, in the past, the United States has always considered him as upholding universal values. However, there was a change in the United States foreign policy during the Kissinger era. He believed that the core should be the national interest of the United States and not ideological. Kissinger has also made a famous remark in the past. No nation can make its survival dependent on the goodwill of another state. In plain terms, it means, in reality, the United States doesn't have a very strong moral obligation towards any country. And you have to rely on your own abilities to survive. To be honest, this statement sounds quite blunt. But at the same time, it is indeed a reality. Actually, the improving of relations between China and the United States can be seen as a result of the pragmatic foreign policy approach of the United States from a certain perspective. So you can see that Henry Kissinger played a very significant role in the formulation of the foreign policy of the United States at that time. So some people will evaluate Kissinger as good, saying that in this aspect he was pragmatic in handling American foreign policy. But what about those who disagree? After he improved relations with China, he ended up nurturing a hostile nation to the detriment of the US. The China of that time, although a large country, was actually a weak nation. However, after the improvement of Sino-US relations, China gradually became an integral part of the world and transformed into a major power. Now it has become the most significant competitor of the United States within the global order. One could even say, China is just simply an adversary. So, isn't this Henry Kissinger's doing? If there wasn't such a diplomatic improvement between China and the United States, China may not pose a realistic threat to the United States today. This is one perspective. Taiwan certainly doesn't have anything good to say about Kissinger because Taiwan essentially suffered as a result of the normalization of Sino-US relations. It is said 
that when Chiang Ching Kuo, the leader of Taiwan, heard about Henry Kissinger's visit to the mainland back then, he was so angry that he couldn't sleep at night. He said that Kissinger is a spy and is destroying Sino-U.S. relations. Of course, when he says the relationship between China and the United States, he is referring to the relationship between the Republic of China, Taiwan, and the United States. Mainland China's evaluation of Kissinger is high, regarding him as the old friend of the Chinese people. The highest praise that Chinese people give to foreigners is that they are old friends of the Chinese people. On the day that Henry Kissinger passed away, Xi Jinping also sent his condolences to the President of the United States. You can only imagine this level of courtesy. So, how should we evaluate Henry Kissinger in the end? Today I will share my own opinions. Actually, this question can be roughly translated as, how should one view the normalization of Sino-US relations during the last century? First of all, we do need to talk about the background here. The progressive normalization of relations between China and the United States in 1971 was indeed a miracle. I just mentioned that China was a major power in the communist world at that time. Not only that, but it was also the most militant. Think about it. Compared to China at that time, the Soviet Union still had some rationality, but in reality, China had no sense of rationality compared to the Soviet Union. China underwent the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, which were far more insane than what happened in the Soviet Union. So, from an, an ideological perspective, it can be said that the United States and China should have even less overlap. There's no need to even mention how they viewed the United States at that time. The United States was the figurehead of imperialism. To think that these two countries could break the ice, meet with each other, and establish diplomatic relations, isn't that just a miracle? So why were China and the United States able to establish warm diplomatic relations at that time? Actually, it's very simple. It is precisely because they wanted to jointly deal with the Soviet Union. From a Chinese perspective, the reason for the later deterioration of relations between China and the Soviet Union was due to the conflict between Mao Zedong and Nikita Khrushchev. The Soviet Union began to deploy a million troops along the Sino-Soviet border. A prolonged military conflict between China and the Soviet Union was narrowly avoided. First, there was a fight in the north on Zhengbao Island. Following that, there was another battle between the Soviet Union and China in Xinjiang. At that time, the Soviet Union wanted to formulate a plan to deal with China. Moreover, during the planning process, the Soviet Union once considered using nuclear weapons against China. So, at that time, China wholeheartedly felt the security threat from the Soviet Union. In this context, China began to consider whether it is possible to improve its relationship with the United States. If China improved its relationship with the United States, the Soviet Union would be more cautious and fearful if they were to attack. China needed this. So what did the United States need? The Soviet Union, as the leader of the socialist camp at that time, implemented an expansionist foreign policy globally. In Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union began to constantly attempt export revolutions. This includes its invasion of Afghanistan and so on. So, the United States considered the Soviet Union as its number one global enemy. At that time, because China opposed the Soviet Union, the United States saw China as a potential pawn. So, do you see where this is going? Sino-US relations improved via the pragmatic, diplomatic approach of the United States. China had also abandoned the previous ideological-oriented diplomatic approach in its foreign policy. Both countries adopted the policy of pragmatic diplomacy. Two completely hostile countries had surprisingly come together to shake hands and make peace. After the visit of Nixon to China, China informed three of its allies, namely Vietnam, North Korea, and Albania. Because at that time China didn't have many allies, and had offended most of the communist countries. Western countries are also not considered friends. These three allies, in fact, expressed strong opposition. In North Korea, Albania, and Vietnam, you can see that they were still immersed in that kind of ideological struggle. However, China's foreign policy had undergone a change. It transformed from an ideology-driven approach to a pragmatism-driven diplomatic strategy. This has had a significant impact on both China and the United States, including the political landscape of the previous century. I have always believed that I can rank the major international events of the past century. Uh, the most important events are definitely the two world wars. This was followed by the dissolution of the Soviet Union. 
But if we rank third, then I would have to prioritize the improvement of CNO-US relations. The improving of relations between China and the United States marked when both countries simultaneously abandoned the ideology-driven foreign policy approach and were moving towards a more pragmatic diplomatic path. This was an extremely profound event that has had a significant impact on both China and the United States. Of course, after the establishment of diplomatic relations between China and the United States, China rapidly rose to prominence due to its reforms and opening up policies. After its rise, there have been various conflicts and confrontations between China and the United States. So in my opinion, you have to tack on another dimension to their relationship. That is to say, the United States definitely does not like countries like China right now. But back then, the Soviets were engaged in a nuclear arms race, space race, and military competition with the United States to the extent that they could mutually destroy each other dozens of times over. So, why is there such a big conflict between China and the United States now? It's because the country of the Soviet Union no longer exists, as the strategic goals of the United States have already been achieved. So the strategic foundation of close cooperation between China and the United States no longer exists. This is an objective fact. Since that goal no longer exists, the past between China and the United States can be concealed. Some of the conflicts that were put aside in the past have gradually resurfaced, but we still need to see how the future of Sino-US relations will unfold. Many people are now discussing whether there is a possibility of a new Cold War between China and the United States. Because back then, the relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States developed into a Cold War. There is also another a way it could go. Shen Zhihua recently wrote an article about this topic. I find it very enlightening. He said that the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States was based on three conditions. The first condition is the rapid rise of the Soviet Union. Second was its entrance into the international order. Thirdly, was the newly created conflicts between major powers. The so-called rapid rise refers to the relatively fast economic development of the Soviet Union after the war. Military development was also relatively rapid. It quickly developed into a major power and entered into the international community. That means at the Yalta Conference after World War II, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union were bound together, establishing the current United Nations. Uh, because at that time, there was a need to collectively deal with Nazi Germany. A new system of international order was formed. The third aspect is the conflicts between major powers. This one is quite obvious. The ideological conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union began to gradually emerge during the post-war period. So in recent years, with China's rise, many people have been discussing whether a new Cold War will emerge between China and the United States. Using Professor Shen Jihua's analytical framework from before, you can see that there are similarities. For example, China has experienced rapid growth in national strength since implementing reforms and opening up. The same is true of entering the international order. Since China's reform and opening up, it has basically entered the international community in a comprehensive manner. The third aspect is the conflicts between major powers. The conflicts and tensions between China and the United States have been growing larger compared to the past, coinciding with China's rise. Is it possible for it to evolve into a new Cold War, like the United States and the Soviet Union did back then? This question is addressed in the book On China, written by Henry Kissinger himself. It is, of course, an issue of great concern to the international community. Professor Shen Jihua also mentioned his viewpoint in his paper. His analysis simply states it won't happen. China has several factors that are different from the conditions at that time. These different factors mainly include the following aspects. The first aspect is that China's economic system is different from that of the Soviet Union. China is a market economy. The Soviet Union had a planned economy system. At that time, the Soviet Union and the United States were economically interdependent. After the end of World War II, the United States implemented the Marshall Plan. At first, it included Eastern European countries, but they kicked out the Soviet Union, who later refused to let those Eastern European countries participate. Later on, the countries in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union formed a socialist bloc. The socialist bloc was essentially economically integrated, so externally, 
they had very little close contact with Western countries, led by the United States. Economically, it was relatively isolated and separated. China is different, however. China is now in the same economic world as the United States and Europe. Professor Shen Jihua's viewpoint is that two countries that exist primarily in the same economic world cannot completely separate from each other. Therefore, there will always be both competition and cooperation between these two countries. So they cannot have a real Cold War, because during an actual Cold War, both of these countries would become victims. Now, they are both in it together. I think I mostly agree with this analysis. But uh, do you know what I feel is the only uncertain factor here? Uh, the situation in the Taiwan Strait. In fact, the opening battle of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union was the Korean War. Because the Korean War broke out, it eventually led to the division of the two major camps. On one side, NATO was established, while on the other side, there was the Warsaw Pact. So, if a war were to break out between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait due to the issue of national reunification or any other reason, no one can guarantee whether the US military would participate. Nobody can also say for certain to what extent will they participate in the war. In this case, would there even be a military confrontation between China and the United States? Shen Jihua did not mention this point. I believe this is the biggest wild card in the future chess match between China and the United States. The issue of Taiwan depends greatly on the direction of leadership of the Chinese government. In Henry Kissinger's book on China, he also addresses this question and believes that there will not be a new Cold War between China and the United States. He was comparing it to France and Germany in the past. Before the unification of Germany, it was the Prussian Federation in Europe with little power. After unification, Germany became the most powerful country in Europe. Metaphorically, many people say, today's China is somewhat similar to recently unified Germany. So its rise will definitely lead to a structural conflict like the ones Germany had with France and other European countries. However, Henry Kissinger uh, also mentioned another perspective he had when he said that uh, the game between Germany and other European countries during World War I was a zero-sum game. It means that once this country wins, other countries will inevitably lose. Therefore, the conflict between Germany and France was inevitable due to the kind of game they were playing. However, the international system has undergone a profound transformation since World War II. It's no longer a zero-sum game anymore. He believes that the conflict between the United States and China is something different slowly now. drift into a situation comparable to some of the aspects of the Cold War the prospects of globalization uh, would be severely impaired. Uh, the Asian development would, uh, uh, would suffer. And at the end of it, uh, we would not have advanced uh, many of the objectives in the name of which this is uh, allegedly conducted. I believe the, some of these uh, differences are real. Uh, but also there is a consciousness that they need to be overcome. These days, the, the so-called differences among respective interests can be discussed. Uh, interests can be divided, separated, and seeded. There is no longer an institutional foundation for conflicts such as those between uh, Germany and other countries before World War I. Um, I think this analysis makes a lot of sense. Following that, Kissinger mentioned a vision of future U.S.-China relations in his book on China. In response to the question, what should the relationship between the United States and China be in the future? He said, it's definitely not a partnership. There exists a conflict of ideologies and, and national interests between China and the United States. So it is difficult for them to establish a long-lasting relationship of mutual trust. But he said that, in fact, a healthy relationship between these two countries is one of mutual evolution. The concept of common evolution means that the United States is constantly advancing on the basis of its own system. Of course, there is no problem for you to evolve and develop together with those who are like-minded. China is the same as well. China is constantly developing according to its own system and model. Then these two countries engage in a kind of competitive conflict and cooperation with each other. He said, 
This is the most important so-called coexistence model in the development of future Sino-US relations. In the past couple of days, when I had nothing to do, I carefully read this book by Henry Kissinger. I feel like I gained something from it. So today, I'm using this episode to share with everyone the viewpoints of this recently departed political figure. I basically agree with Kissinger's perspective. It is unlikely that a new Cold War will occur between China and the United States in the future. But the difference between me and Professor Shen Jihua is that I believe the uncertainty lies in whether there will be a possible war in the Taiwan Strait. But at the end of the show, I still want to talk about how I said, Kissinger really knows how to live. He lived to be 100 years old. He himself shared his secret. First, he is not into exercising. You see, many politicians in the United States live long because they exercise regularly. Look at how fit Obama's body is. It's obvious that he works out regularly. However, Kissinger does not exercise. He does not play golf. He himself said, the secret to his longevity lies in working non-stop. He said he has been working 16 hours a day consistently for decades. So I was thinking that when we say life is in motion, it may have two different layers of meaning. On one hand, it means that exercise can slow down the aging process. On the other hand, there is all the movement going on inside your brain because your brain is constantly thinking. In fact, it not only keeps the brain functioning well, but also makes the body work harder to support all the activity going on inside your brain. So I think the fact that Kissinger could live to be 100 years old caused me to have a revelation. I need to continuously work hard and study. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you. The government of the People's Republic of China and the government of the United States have had great differences. We will have differences in the future. But what we must do is to find a way to see that we can have differences without being enemies in war. with Xi Jinping. Name me one. Name me one. It's never, ever been a good bet to bet against America. Never. Ready. Close. Ready. Cut. Ready. Face. Board. I have spent literally half of my life working on Chinese-American 